Hi, everyone. Welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska. One of the best places in the world to watch brown bears fishing for salmon. And right now we're looking at one of the biggest bears on the river, the bear that you know as number 32, also nicknamed Chunk. And I think he's probably going to be a center of attention during our bear camp play-by-play -play today, which is uh, on September 14, 2023. It's hard to believe it's already so late in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere and especially in North America. Uh, but to have uh, to <laughs> to help us along with the journey today, I'm, I'm joined by my co-host, Katmai National Park Ranger uh, Naomi Boak. Naomi, I seem to have made the mistake of actually uh, not uh, changing the name there. Riri. I know. But well, I'm posing as Felice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I, Let me... I am not. I am not Felice. Oh, there we go. Naomi. Yep, there you no, go. As long as I can spell your name right, there we go. Okay, perfect. I'm very well today. It's been um, it's been busy around Brooks Camp, and um, I really love looking at Chunk. He is gorgeous right now. Chunk is one of the more prominent bears uh, and, and recognizable bears on Brooks River. Really big adult male, probably 1,200 plus pounds right now, in, in my estimation. That really distinctive scar across his muzzle sort of narrow, uh, close set eyes. Um, so I, you know, he's one of the easier bears to recognize. And also since I was a little bit confused at the beginning of our broadcast today, not so smooth with my introduction, I also realized I forgot to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org and the resident naturalist with explore.org. We're going to be talking about brown bears and salmon today. Uh, Naomi, we got a ton to talk about, of course. And I, I hope our internet is going to be a bit more stable than the last two play-by-plays where we've had some bad luck with internet outages, power outages. Uh, but I think things look a little stable, at least in my neighborhood. Uh, the sky is mostly clear right now. The winds are calm. Um, and it looks like you have a great day at the river, too. Yeah. And um, also our tech team has been out here and they did something to improve our um, Wi-Fi reception in our office. So fingers crossed the internet gods are with us today. And Mike, you are the host who needs no introduction. <laughs> well, let's, let me introduce some of the other cameras to everybody real quick before we get into the uh, program today, as we always like to do. So we have the Brooks Falls camera, which we were just looking at, but we also have the Falls Low camera, which is located at a bear's eye view of the river itself. Um, is just below the main falls camera we have the riffles camera which is located about 100 yards downstream of brooks falls we have the river watch camera which is located near the river mouth and that camera and the cats riverview camera have been really great to watch over the past um, week to two weeks because there's been a ton of activity down there with bears scavenging for dead and dying salmon we have the underwater camera. Hopefully we'll get to see some salmon um, hanging out in the vicinity of there, even though there is a little bit of a, a fuzz growing on the camera housing right now. And it's actually cleared up rub on Dumpling Mountain. Like, uh, <laughs> just rub it in that it needs cleaning. Yeah, sorry. Um, I didn't mean to do that, but if yeah, I, I could point it out a bit more. Uh, personally if you want to a little bit later in the in the broadcast but up on dumpling mountain okay. uh, a clear view right now which we haven't had uh recently so we might go up there too depending on what we have um to talk about now if you're new to bear cam let me uh give you a quick tour of where brooks river is in relation to everything else uh, because brooks river is located about 300 miles southwest of anchorage alaska in katmai national park Brooks River itself is bisected by Brooks Falls, and it's only about a mile and a half long. So it's really just a, a little under three kilometers. Not very long. It flows generally from this view from left to right. And along with our webcam partner, the National Park Service, Explore.org, hosts and maintains several webcams along Brooks River. The signal from the webcams is either sent to the top of Dumpling Mountain and hopped off of a couple of radio repeaters to the small town of King Salmon, where the park headquarters is, about 30 miles away, or uh, it's sent directly to a, a, a satellite uplink, internet uh, uplink. And uh, taking a look at the river again, just to give you a, a better perspective on where the cameras are located. Again, we have Brooks Falls on the left. So we have our cameras in that vicinity and then down at the river mouth. 
Uh, more specifically, let's look, take a look at some updated imagery. Brooks Falls on the left-hand side of the page, the camera there is gonna focus mostly right in front of it at the Bears at the Falls, but occasionally it can look downstream as well. And then we have the Riffles camera uh, downstream of the falls that can look across the river and upstream to the falls. We have uh, the River Watch camera near the river mouth, and we can take a look at um, much of the lower half of Brooks River upstream of the bridge. And then we also have uh, cats, or excuse me, the underwater camera, which is pointed downstream, attached to a piling on the bridge itself. And then we have the Cats Riverview camera that looks out towards um, the river mouth and Knack Knack Lake. So we have a really great perspective on most of the lower half of Brooks River. Naomi and I are going to try to answer some questions that were submitted in advance through Ask Your Bear Cam questions. So if you have questions for any of our live events that you want Rangers or myself to answer, throw those into this uh, Google form. A moderator will be happy to help you find the link to that in the comments right now if you have them. And we also invite everybody to get ready for Fat Bear Week, um, especially Fat Bear Week in the classroom. Um, if you're a teacher uh, or you know one, we encourage teachers to use um, Fat Bear Week in their classroom to help their students engage with nature, especially the brown bears and salmon in Katmai National Park. Um, and we're gonna have uh, some special videos this year for um, students that submit their questions uh, through this form. And a moderator will be happy to help you uh, find the link to that as well. So thanks to all of our webcam uh, moderators and our cam ops who are driving the cameras and making us uh, or giving us this great experience. Uh, and Naomi, I guess we should go back to Chunk right now because as, as I look at uh, our different camera views, he is the one that is most prominent and um, also probably, you know, a Fat Bear Week contender uh, this year. Yeah, I, I would I would think so. I mean, look at that wide load. Um, I you know the other day you said that you thought he is as big as seven four seven, and I agree. Um, oh, now he's giving us a better view. Um, he he is so big this year um, that light bulb shaped bear. Um, when you see him near seven four seven, I mean he is very competitive. Yeah, he's a, uh, a, a an interesting bear to watch. This year, he he really does seem to have asserted his dominance in a way that he hadn't been prone to in the past. He's done it before, um, and certainly he's a really big-bodied bear. So when he wants to throw his weight around, there are very few bears that can challenge him because they're just not big enough. Um, but in years past, he consistently deferred to seven four seven, but not this summer. Um, in fact, uh, you know when Chunk returned early in uh early in september 747 was at the river and then 747 left shortly thereafter. now that could have been just coincidence naomi but maybe not maybe 747 just didn't want to deal with the competition of of having number 32 in his face more often when he had you know the 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 entire month of august at brooks river really where he was uh you know top bear yeah um it Junk definitely, you know, had that moment of intimidating 747. I mean, we, we won't know for sure what was in 747's mind, but um, I mean, watching the hierarchy for the rest of the season, I know 856 has been back, not been around very much, but um, we could be in for quite a show. And it looks like I'm getting, I got a message from one of our camera operators that um, maybe 32 had caught a fish or maybe I missed it. We'll see uh, in just a moment here. Uh, Chunk loves to fish the spot on the far wall. We'll see him near the boulders. So a little bit closer to the camera, maybe about like two thirds of the way across the river. Uh, occasionally we'll see him in the jacuzzi as well. So he will fish in, uh, in different locations. He's also a bear, Naomi, one of the few bears that, uh, that you can see um, in in the Brooks River vicinity in in May. So this is kind of he makes this part of his home range in late summer and also very early in the season. Great catch by him there. Yeah, yeah. He we he's one of the first bears we we see um, when when we get here. Um, he meanders through camp and 
No, he'll leave for a while, come back, but um, he got a live one. Good for him. Yeah, this is a pretty fresh salmon. And um, with it, when you see a salmon this color at Brooks River at this time of the year, this is almost certainly a coho salmon. The sockeye salmon have already changed into their spawning colors. So the sockeye salmon have red bodies, green heads. Uh, the coho salmon arrive much later in the summer, and some of them might still be pretty fresh from the ocean, only a few days removed from the ocean, haven't yet changed into their spawning colors. Uh, so I think uh, Chunk here has a pretty big meal. The, so the coho are larger uh, than the sockeye on average. And it looks like, uh, yep, big hunk of eggs there. So that was a female, <laughs> looks yeah. like a female salmon. And, female. and Chunk is certainly, wow, look at the amount of eggs there. That All that bright, bright red. Is it, that's all like salmon. So that cat. is just, yeah, just a, that is a huge amount of calories uh, for that bear. And it must, I, I, I bet it tastes especially satisfying uh, for him yes. when you're eating just like a, a mouthful of fish oil. That is just perfect food for a bear at this time of the year. Yeah. Yeah, it is great. Um, not that he really needs it, but, um, but he does need it. Um, even the big boys need to get as many calories as they can get. They, they seem so fat to us and he probably could survive hibernation right now, but the more calories he gets, the better off he is. Yeah, that's a, you know, an interesting point is that, um, you know, the bears that we see at Brooks River right now, many of them are fat enough to survive hibernation well, uh, you know, in other habitats, other ecosystems, bears go into hibernation with much, much less body fat than what we see here at Brooks River. So if you're a bear that can afford to sit at the, at the river and a lot of along other, these other salmon streams throughout the year, that gives you a tremendous advantage uh, because you can wait for your food to come to you and not expend a lot of energy. So our, I think our bears here at Brooks River are maybe proportionally fatter than a lot of other bears um, across uh, par different parts of North America. However, um, you know, now that I think about that, I do re recall reading a study recently which found that bears, um, are really good at finding different food sources and getting fat no matter what they have available to eat. Um, so like a bear in Gates of the Arctic National Park in Northern Alaska is can be almost as proportionally fat as what you find at Brooks River. Um, they're just smaller versions of it. So they can't grow as big as chunk because they don't have as much food available to them. Um, so that I think now that I think about it, I want to walk back on my statement a little bit and say that, yeah, um, hmm. the, the real difference is like the body mass overall between bears at Brooks River and in, in different places in North America. Most of the bears aren't gonna grow as big because they don't have access to as much food. So bears in other habitats work really hard to get fat. They're just smaller bodied overall. And would have a similar percentage as a fat? Is that what, what the study said? Yeah, that's, I think what I recall reading, um, they were looking at, um, bears in Alaska uh, and other parts uh, of North America were finding something similar uh, as far as body fat percentage goes uh, between different bears. Uh, but it's it's the body mass, one of the, the body mass that's um, a big difference. Like the female bears in Katmai, the full grown female bears at this time of the year are much bigger than full grown adult males in the Yellowstone region uh, on average. So that's, you know, that indicates that the, the bears here have just have access to so much more food compared to bear, to brown and grizzly bears in other habitats. I mean, we're, we're watching the um, Riffles cam right now. Um, and speaking of coho salmon, um, uh, my colleagues have been telling me they've been seeing a number of um, coho or silver salmon up there. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I wonder if it's a, a good year for uh, a salmon run, or excuse me, the coho run or not. You know, that's not, as we see that bear walking down river, um, that's, the coho run isn't tracked in this watershed carefully like the sockeye run is because there's not a commercial fishery for it, like in the Naknek River area. Uh, so we don't really know from year to year, like what that coho run is, is really like. Uh, but bears are opportunists. We see them taking advantage of opportunity in many different ways. And one of those ways is to look for spawning salmon. And that, and that bear, we didn't really get to see that catch, Naomi, but it looked like walking along the riverbank um, 
looking for a salmon that's not paying attention, jumping into the water and it looks like it got one. Yeah. There are, there are a lot of salmon in the river right now. And a lot who are spawning, especially around the riffles, you can, you can see the gravel and, 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 uh, sand, um, in the riffles. So there was a lot of activity and a lot more salmon for the bears to eat. And the bear scavenging some of the salmon, uh, that has, that have already spawned and died in the lower river. So we're going down to our river watch camera right now. Good look at a bear that's picking up uh, a fish that can't swim away, chowing down on it. Naomi, you've been, you've been talking about, uh, to, or at least with me, about how busy this area is with bears right now. So when you walk across the bridge, you know, what are you typically seeing? Oh, I see maybe 10 bears down there um, and, and bears coming in and out. I mean, Normally it takes me like five minutes to walk over the bridge when I go home. It takes me probably an hour, an hour and a half now because there are so many bears there. I don't want to leave the bridge. Um, I just want to stay there and, and watch the bears. Um, and we're seeing family groups. We're seeing large bears. Um, they're all coming down there. Um, Last night there was a bear down there. I had a very slow commute home because, and I believe it was one of the grazer um, independent subs. Um, and I had, I walked 50 yards behind her from the bridge to the falls trail. Um, just another consequence of a lot of bears being on the lower river. This bear, uh, you know, in contrast to what we see up at the Brooks uh, at Brooks Falls, where bears can, like Chunk, he can sit there and he can wait for salmon to come to him. This bear being a bit more methodical uh, in its searching patterns, so looking in the areas of slow moving water, eddies, side channels, uh, also you know places along the edge of the river where grass is growing, because salmon that are dying tend to sort of collect in those areas. Uh, we also see sometimes bears in this vicinity, digging up clay and eating it. And I think uh, that's a little bit of a anti-diarrheal uh, medication for them. We don't know that for sure. Could give them some minerals. Um, some people speculate that when you're eating clay, uh, it helps the bears, you know, kind of rid their digestive tract of some parasites. You can imagine if you're like a, you know, some worms in there and you, there's just like this big hunk of undigestible uh, clay coming down the, the, the system that is gonna be hard for you to avoid. Um, but it's, it's one thing that we'll see bears doing in this vicinity besides just, uh, scavenging salmon. Yeah. We've been seeing a lot of that lately. Have you been seeing a lot of tapeworms? Um, not recently, but I was going through my photos and I came across this great photo of 747 with this huge tapeworm coming out of his butt. One for, one for the records. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, even in, in humans, like uh, tapeworms can grow close to like eight meters long uh, or thirty feet in some in some cases. So uh, you know, I imagine in a bear, you know, if we see a tapeworm hanging out the back, it's not the full extent of the tapeworm. It's probably much much longer or longer than that up in the bear's uh, digestive right. tract itself. And I and I think all bears at this time of the year have have tapeworms because they get them by eating raw salmon. While we're Naomi, while we're looking at um, the River Watch camera uh, right now, there was a, uh, a curious situation that happened yesterday, which I think might be a good. This might be a good time uh, to address in the play-by-play. -play. Um, that situation had to do with um, uh, a mother bear that we know as, as not, uh, who is identified as nine zero one. Uh, throughout the summer, she had three cubs, and Yesterday, um, we're you know on the River Watch camera, so the same camera that we were just looking at live footage from, uh, upstream of the of the River Watch camera, basically kind of like due west where this area is circled. Um, there was a, an interaction between nine zero one and a couple of other male bears, 
And Naomi, I'll cut to the clip of what we could see on the webcams. You were at the, the bridge at the time. Your perspective was different than what the webcam sees though. But maybe you can kind of like yes. walk walk us through what you saw, what you heard. Yeah, so um, I was on the bridge and I saw um, 901 and, and um, she had what I am calling a kerfluffle. It was a disagreement, it was um, a little fight with um, another bear. And I noticed it, it seemed unusual because I don't usually see um, bears um, fighting with each other on the lower river at this time of year. Um, they kind of spread out, catch the dead and dying salmon. Um, there's play fighting, but not real fighting. And so <clears throat> I saw her um, and that's that's what I saw. She was not happy with that other bear. Yeah, so as we look at this recorded clip from yesterday, this is around 7 p.m. Eastern time or so. 901 was the lighter bear on the bank. She walked uh, upstream. Um, her cubs were somewhere in this vicinity. There was a young adult male in the vicinity at the time. Um, and she backs him into the river. So, and he doesn't really put up a fight. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I wasn't, you know, wasn't trying to cause any trouble here. I got gotcha. you, you sent your message. I'm gonna go on my way. Uh, but then as the camera zooms in, Naomi, there's a, we'll find out there's a much bigger bear uh, in the willows that we can't see from this perspective. And you weren't able to see him either, right? No, from where I was on the bridge, I, I did not see that. The willows obscured that bear from from my perspective. I was, say, probably a little to the left from on the bridge, so I couldn't see that bear. And that's um, a pretty uh, big bear in the background there that'll come right out, give a sort of a, a, a short charge towards um, number 901. So again, you know, we don't, at this point in time, we don't know where her cubs are. Uh, I think it's, you know, we can presume that they're in the, the near vicinity, but we don't actually know. But then you see this big guy come out of the woods right over there, uh, number 32 Chunk. And, you know, his behavior in that situation, Naomi, we don't really know what his motivation was. Uh, I, th I think there's an argument to be made that he did that just because he's a real dominant bear and he doesn't like other bears approaching him. So we don't know if he was interacting with the cubs in this vicinity at the, at the time. We don't know where they were. There's a lot of brush in that area, a lot of places for cubs to scatter um, and to hide. Um, there are trees to climb. They could be running, you know, towards taller trees. Uh, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, it's just a, a hard area to see. So we don't really know what went on back there. Um, the other un unusual thing in terms of behavior that I observed, it was unusual not only to see a couple of bears, you know, having a disagreement on the lower river, but also for 901 to do that. Because I personally, I don't know if you have or cam viewers have observed her pushing off other bears from her cubs, but I really haven't seen her do that. Whereas I've seen other bears like 482, um, who is an experienced mom and has two, two and a half year olds. I saw her actively push away a couple of subs and they weren't that close to her cubs, but she really pushed them off. So at this moment, I, um, it would, that also was unusual because I haven't seen 901 do that this season. And to continue this story, so later on in the, that evening, the camera operators found a couple of cubs uh, in a spruce tree or spruce trees uh, in, you know, sort of in the vicinity where we saw 901, where we saw a chunk before. Uh, and those cubs remained in the tree. This is from, I, I think this is like, I don't know, 10 p.m. or 2 a.m. or something. They were there all night. They were there through much of the morning. Uh, Naomi, they probably were there when you came to work this morning, I'm sure, because I think they were still there around. If I can check my notes, because I was trying to look at the cameras earlier today. Yeah, it, you know, uh, 10 a.m. Alaska time, they were still there. They may have been there um, longer than that. I had to attend to some other things this afternoon, so I'm not sure when they came out of the tree, but they were there quite a long time. 
Yeah, no, when I um, came across the bridge, there was another ranger there with binoculars and confirming that they were still there. And obviously they were there for um, a lot longer, which is unusual, right, Mike? Yeah, you, cubs climb trees uh, frequently. It's it's unusual to have cubs in the tree this long. So, you know, when you're, you're going on 12 hours or more, you know, usually no. Uh, this, uh, you know, to me, this did not say that mom had somehow abandoned them or didn't know where they were. Mother could have just been sleeping, you know, in the bushes below the, below them that we just couldn't happen, couldn't see. And for whatever reason, she didn't bother to call them down or they didn't feel comfortable uh, coming down. In, in 901 and, and other mother bears sometimes will leave their cubs in places where they think the cubs are secure or maybe the cubs feel secure or maybe the mother feels secure and then they'll go fishing off in the distance so cubs aren't always you know right next to mom so that's something to be aware of if you see cubs in trees sometimes mother bears will do that on purpose so they can attend to other things uh and yeah. you, you and he, Naomi, i think you remember telling me uh, 901 has a tendency to do that she the, the times when she will leave her, she will park her cubs um, in the beginning of the season, I saw her tree her cubs a couple of times, but just for a short period of time. Um, but she could, will park her cubs and then be hundreds of yards away fishing. Um, the other unusual thing is that she kind of stuck not in that area. I mean, she went off fishing during those 12 to 15 hours, um, but she was not that far away for her, right? I mean, some mother bears will stick pretty close to their cubs. 901 is not a bear that does that normally. Yeah, so, you know, mother bears have, uh, you know, each has the, its own strategy for raising cubs. Uh, you know, just like in humans, I think we see these individual differences where some mothers are like, you know what, I'd like to let my kids run in the woods a little bit more. And other moms are like, what are you crazy? There's mosquitoes outside. So, you know, to, <laughs> you know, each person has, you know, a different way of raising their children and other, um, and, and mother bears are probably, I think, like that as well. Um, but there was an update from later uh, in the day, Naomi, it seems like a little bit of sad news though, because for... All night, you know, people were watching cubs in the tree, looking for the third cub of 901's litter. But then 901, after her cubs came down out of the tree, walked along the beach in front of the, you know, the lodge and the visitor center uh, where the cameras cannot see. But you were able to confirm that she only had two cubs with her at that time. Yes, she uh, she only had two cubs. And um, actually, uh, Ranger Felicia um, went down there with a the camera and posted um in the chat um some pictures of 901 and her two cubs yeah so um certainly a sad a sad event uh, we you know I, I don't think either naomi or i want to really speculate on you know what happened or how the other bears were involved we know there were other bears in the vicinity i think that's about as far as we can go reasonably um because there's just not, you know, evidence to suggest, you know, there was, we know that Chunk was there, 164 was in the vicinity, it didn't seem like 164 really had anything to do with it. We couldn't really see what Chunk was doing. He just kind of appeared out of the brush. So he was there around that time. But did he cause a separation of that cub? Did a cub actually die? We don't know. Sometimes mother bears just get separated from their cubs. And in a situation that's really scary for cubs, uh, like if you have a big bear, uh, you know, in the vicinity coming towards you, and you know mother's nowhere nearby to protect you uh cubs have a sometimes they'll scatter in different directions so you know i uh i, I don't want to say that you know a cub has died uh, i think we right now we can just say it's it's missing so without further evidence I, i'm not sure we can go any further than that yeah i mean i, I do find it interesting that um that 901 did stay in that area for so long and the cubs were treed for so long um i don't you know i mean there there are different possibilities i mean she could have been looking for the other cub if the cub had been missing i didn't hear any bawling from anywhere um but that doesn't mean there wasn't a missing cub somewhere or her cub could have 
been injured or or dying or dead. We just don't know. And I think we have to um, become more comfortable with saying, I don't know, um, when we're um, watching the lives of these wild animals. We don't always know. Yes, there's a lot we don't know. And in fact, I um, this is a family group, Naomi, on uh, Cat's Riverview camera right now. And we don't know the identity of this mother. Um, seems to be a bear that that's uh, we can't see her on the camera right now. We're just getting a glimpse of a one of the cubs, um, but it seems to be a bear that's habituated and, and used to the Brooks River area. So when she's walked by, it seems like she kind of knows the river corridor. Doesn't seem to be nervous or show um, you know nervousness around people when she's crossing under the bridge. So that indicates to me that it's a bear that has been around. But um, you can help me help me out. I think you've. You've been asking around, and it seems like uh, the identity of the of this mother bear is, is yet to be confirmed. Yeah, it ha it hasn't been confirmed, and um, you know maybe um, the sow with three springers that I saw um, in July, but I I, I don't know. Um, it's not very fat, and the cubs are rather small. Um, what do you, what do you think about that that Mike in terms of time of year and the ability of um, that sow and almost any bear that isn't is not as had as successful a season to really fatten enough fatten up enough for hibernation? Yeah, you know, I, watching that bear, um, the cubs the cubs are small. That doesn't mean they're unhealthy. They're just small. Um, compared to some of the other first year cubs that we've seen on the cameras this year and at the river. Uh, and the mother certainly doesn't seem like she has a lot of fat reserves on her. So whatever is going on, whether she wasn't able to catch fish earlier in the year or enough fish, obviously, or if there's some sort of illness um, that she's experiencing, uh, I don't know. But it, it has been, it does seem like for that, that mother bear, it's been a, a tough summer. Um, and when, when that happens, there is, it's a, it's a challenging situation for mom. It's especially challenging for the cubs. Um, if cubs can make it into hibernation, they're likely to make it through hibernation. It's really kind of like that springtime period when they come out of the dens where there's not a lot of the food to eat. Um, they're still very reliant on mother's uh, fat reserves to produce milk. Um, so that's maybe one of the harder times of the year. Um, there's plenty of food around for the bears right now. But they need to kind of they need to make up for lost time. They need to get fat for winter hibernation, and especially that springtime period um, where there's not a lot of food around for several weeks after they come out of the den. Yeah, um, someone in um, has asked the question that's that's related to this, and it um, and it says, does the size of of salmon runs affect the amount of cubs born? And does the average salmon run this year make it more difficult for moms to keep their cubs healthy and alive? Yeah, let me bring that up for everybody. So it's it's a good question. Um, and to the for the first part, Naomi, it seems like from what I've read, there's some really strong evidence that when you have, of course, more food available to bears, then they're going to reproduce at, at greater rates. Their litters are going to be larger, so essentially, fatter female bears have have bigger litters and they re, and they reproduce more often. So yes, there's a there's a definite strong correlation between that that's been um, confirmed in different places uh, in Alaska, especially, um, and also that seems like that's the case at, at Brooks River uh, as, as well. Um, and then you know, since we had you know this year, we had a more average salmon run compared to what we had seen in the in the past several years. Like if you first started watching the camera in 2020, um, that salmon run was just nuts. That was like off the charts, nuts um, with so many fish. So this year, much different set of circumstances. And it does challenge and make things more difficult for mothers and cubs to keep their, um, their, their cubs healthy and alive. Because it's not, you know, the big guys who are necessarily going to suffer um, the most during years like this, it's going to be, uh, oh, and there's a, there's a cub right now, right in the center of our screen. It's going to be, um, the mothers because they have to expend so much energy into, into reproducing. Yeah. And I think we've had this kind of, um, 
confluence, unfortunately, where we've had a, a lot of the now that's a healthy cub. I'm sorry, I have to stop what I'm saying. <laughs> that's a healthy cub. It's uh makes me smile. We can all smile after all that sadness. There's a there's something to smile about. A very healthy cub. Yeah, and I'm but I'm gonna continue to uh, say yeah, yeah, go oh, ahead. And it got um, but I, I was just going to say that there's been this um, confluence of a year when we've had an, an, a lot of cubs. There were 17 spring cubs at the beginning of the season, and we've had a lot of yearlings and two and a half year olds. Um, but all those all those family groups have a greater challenge this year because the salmon run was more difficult to catch this year. There weren't as many jumping the falls. The water levels were high. So um, access to salmon was not quite as easy for those family groups and there were many more of them. And I'm, I'm curious to know where this uh, this cub's mother is. Could be out fishing. Uh, yeah. Not really sure. Again, the camera has just like a really, you know, uh, limited perspective. It can't see 180 degrees or 360 degrees like we would be able to do if we were standing on the bridge um, itself. But yeah, that is definitely a first year cub, a fluffy one, looking pretty good for itself, scavenging a little bit of salmon as it walks along the river. Uh, but yeah, definitely uh, a more challenging year for family groups because of uh, fewer salmon compared to recent years. And then also, yeah, when uh, first part of the question, if, uh, if when there's more food, definitely there's gonna be um, uh, more cubs produced in the future. And Naomi, looking at some of the stats uh, that was done from um, the, the park's current wildlife biologist, Leslie Scora did a thesis using the Brooks River Bear monitoring data. And she ended up finding that uh, from 2000 to 2018, the average number of spring cubs per year was 9.2. Um, and then 17, the average number of dependent cubs per year that's of all ages was, uh, let's see, 17.8. So you know, this year at the beginning of the year, having 17 spring cubs is much greater than average from that early part of the 21st century. So like those, those first 18 years of, of the 2000s, uh, much different um, than, than this year. Uh, so yeah, average, just, just, uh, just over nine cubs per year during those first 18 years and 17 this year means that there's been a lot of food available to a lot of mother bears. So, um, Mike, we just got a question um, asking, um, you know, that cub is alone. Could it be lost? And I'm going to say probably not because it doesn't look nervous. It's not looking around for mom. It's scavenging for food. And that's a place where um, mothers who are fishing in the river and in the lake park their cubs. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, I think, you know, this would be a situation where we, I think we would need some pretty careful observation from our webcam viewers. Um, right. And also people on the ground at Brooks River to look around and see, you know, how this bear is interacting with other bears. Um, you know, if a cub was to be separated from its mom, for instance, and we talked about how that's a possibility with, you know, one of 901's cubs be, you know, missing. Uh, you know, eventually it's going to have to, you know, get on with, get on with its life. And that might mean returning to areas where mother had taken it in the past, uh, where it feels comfortable and safe or it found safety and security before. Uh, it's, it's, and even first year cubs have really strong instincts that, that it can help them to survive these situations alone and maybe eventually reunite with, um, with mother if they happen to be in the same vicinity. So I'm not sure, um, you know, it's possible that you know, this cub could be, you know, tied to a mother that's fishing. We just can't see her right now. Uh, or can't, one of our camera operators said that it traveled alone from the Riverwatch camera to the um, to where we see it right now. Uh, so, yeah, we're not not quite sure yet, but uh, an interesting part of the story. And I think it's maybe the right color for the cub that 901 was missing. But um, the, the camera viewers who pay more attention to the colors of the cubs than I do can uh, can help me out yeah. with that. <laughs> and, and confirm well, or that would, be, that, would be, that would be a nice thought um yeah um i mean we have witnessed separated cubs um i was it 
one of 708s that got separated for a while. And I remember running it in, in 2021, running into it in camp. And it was really looking around and nervous. Um, but it was a yearling. It wasn't a Springer. And also there was that instance, uh, was that, I forget what year it was. It was either 2019 or 2021, Naomi, and you were at Brooks Camp when uh, number 505s, I think it was her yearling, got uh, sick and wasn't able to keep up with mom. And mom and and the sibling of that litter just disappeared. Um, and right. then, you know, the, 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 the sick bear, the sick cub eventually got up somehow recovered but we had all every i think everybody had sort of assumed that they were separated for for the year and then they came back in september and they were together we know that they were apart for more than a week at least oh they were they were separated for um almost the entire season i mean i never saw them that was 2019 and i never saw them together again when they were here and that cub when it got better was getting salmon scraps on its own it was hanging out with sub adults um never saw it with um 505 and its sibling again that season but they came back together the next year bear scavenging still in the river mouth doesn't seem to be attached to that cub at all so i think that's maybe an independent bear that's swimming away uh right now and if you're just joining us thanks for being here today uh, and joining us for the broadcast, my name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. I'm talking with Katmai National Park Ranger Naomi Boak. We're talking bears and salmon and answering, uh, trying to answer a few viewer questions um, along the way as well. Naomi, I think this gives us an opportunity to maybe address one of those other questions that came in in advance uh, because somebody was wondering, is there an age or size when there's no risk of a bigger, older bear? killing them. And I think this is a, this question is in reference to like cubs, for instance, or maybe young bears uh, in general. We know that first year cubs, those spring cubs are the most vulnerable to attack from other bears. But as they get older, um, they're definitely at less risk. Although, you know, if you're, you know, kind of a small female bear, maybe that risk never disappears completely. I mean, what kind of situation would there have to be for um and you know say a, a larger yearling or a young adult small female to be um attacked by a larger bear yeah i think it had to be like opportunity that the larger bear sees maybe an injury that makes you know the smaller bear vulnerable that sort of thing a uh like I, I, I bet like a third year bear, so like a two and a half year old, especially like a, a an independent sub adult bear, they could easily outrun a bear like Chunk, for instance. Like so, Chunk's not going to be able to mm -hmm. run down, you know, a, a bear that's a, a, only a few years old. The, the the younger bears are just much much faster than Chunk, and especially like a a big bear like Chunk, who is I think he's still at the falls. Um, or he was there. So let's check out and see if he's still in that vicinity. There he is in the far pool. Yeah. He's not going to be able to run very far without overheating. <laughs> so that's that's one of the consequences of being so, so such large bodied and being covered with fur and having all of that body fat is that you just tend to overheat really easily. Uh, so you have a really high volume uh, compared to your surface area. And, you know, you, you just can't cool off as easily as a, as a smaller bear. So those, those other bears are going to be able to outrun them. So I think Naomi, it's maybe more about opportunity for, you know, maybe to attack another one could be uh, motivational as well. And besides opportunity, like, is that bear really hungry? And is, is it looking at another bear as a meal? Uh, or it could be maybe again, circumstantial bear, you know, a big bear decides to assert his dominance or a mother bear gets in a situation where she defends herself um, and gets caught in a position where, you know, the over, you know, a very large adult male just overwhelms her with his strength and size. I think there's maybe several factors that, uh, yeah. that go into those situations. Yeah. I mean, I also think about situation that we don't see very often at Brooks, but when, um, a bear has a cache, um, that perhaps it would be defending it and a smaller bear could get into trouble 
in that situation. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of situations. I think, you know, the younger, bear, certainly the younger, the bear, the more vulnerable they are to attack from other, uh, large bears. And, um, I think, I'm not sure if I just missed it or not. I got a, uh, message from our camera operators that, um, yeah, there's a bear, um, with a fish. Yeah. Maybe moving towards the riverbank. So I'm, again, I'm wondering if this, bear that that cub we had been seeing does belong to this bear that was fishing out in the mouth. I thought it maybe was an independent bear, but I guess not. Right. I mean, we're seeing right. yeah, that happy reunion right there. I think it's um, 806 and her cub. Um, uh, they've been around a lot and her cub is huge like that. So um, I think that's, that's what we're seeing. Yeah, you did also mention though, as we see the park's uh, la large landing craft going by, that's how they get things in and out of Brooks Camp that can't be flown in. So like things like diesel fuel and stuff like that to run the generators for the lodge and the cabins that the rangers stay in. That's how it gets back and forth. Um, eight or six, yeah, she has a single spring cub this year. And Naomi, I, um, before the, the 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 landing craft that is nicknamed the Q uh, distracted me, You were I was uh, mentioning how you were, had mentioned that that cub did re look really relaxed along the edge of the river. Like yeah. it wasn't in a situation where it had been separated from mom. So it may have been very well aware of where mom was, you know, as we see 806, yeah. he was, you know, just off of the riverbank fishing. And now, you know, they're both enjoying a meal. Yeah. I mean, when, whenever I've seen a cub separated from its mom, you know, there was that sick cub, but when I've seen cubs, separated they're they're nervous they're not calm like this cub was it's also interesting to see how uh 806 here brought that fish back to shallow water to eat it you know and whether that was uh you know something that she wanted to do because she wanted to share with her cub or maybe she just didn't want to eat it in deep water i'm not sure often mother bears would just like eat out in the lake and their cubs would just kind of sit there watching mom eat and probably feeling those hunger pangs, but not being able to uh, fulfill them because mom is, is so far away. Because often mother bears do not share. Most of the time, they do not, you know, make any effort to share food with uh, with their cubs. They, you know, if the cubs can take food from them, then fine. But other than that, uh, they they really don't make any effort to bring food to their cubs. Yeah, there's a funny thing going on with the 910 family. Um, uh, both 910 Junior and 909 Junior are so loud. And they they are yelling at mom to get, to get that fish. And she doesn't want to share. And you just hear it all over the river and in camp. And they're not even in camp. They're in the river. Um, and uh, she does not want to share. <laughs> in 806 she is a first time mother memory serves correct no no oh the second 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 time second letter second for time. her okay yeah um she has i'm um, all confused now it's uh, been too many years watching bears uh 306 was her cub oh that's right yes and 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 um and that was her first litter and she was so confused. She did not know what to do. And 306 is a very social bear. And um, as a cub, it played with uh, Holly's cub, which is now 335. Um, and you know, 806 just didn't know what to do. And she's much calmer this year. I mean, it just shows that, you know, those mother bears learn. It takes a litter or so to learn what to do and and we see that pretty clearly i was saying to mike that we saw 482 back um with her uh two and a half year olds and i i was really i really noticed her behavior was what i expect a mother bear to do which is she chased off sub adults that were not that close but too near for her liking she huffed to get her cubs closer to her um so they were safe and because there are so many young mothers around, we haven't been seeing as much of that experienced sow behavior. So just seeing 806 here, I mean, she's so much calmer than she was with her first cub. 
Right. There's a big difference between the behavior of experienced mothers and first time mothers. It, I think it's just a steep learning curve for those fir first time mama bears trying to figure out how to care for their cubs and provide for their safety and growth. While at the same time, you know, managing, uh, you know, their own needs. Um, so mother's own needs getting fat. So, so sometimes, you know, the things that worked for them as an independent bear when they were younger won't work when they're trying to raise uh, cubs overall. And you can see, I think with the difference, you know, Naomi 482 is a great example. She seems to, you know, she has almost like this confidence, like I know exactly what I'm doing at Brooks River. I've been here for like 20 plus years. I've brought my cubs here before. I'll do it again, I'm doing it this summer. And I know exactly where to go and how to keep them safe and where I can find food. And then the younger bears, especially, um, you know, first time moms, if they bring their cubs to Brooks Falls, there's almost like a, um, and it, to anthropomorphize a little bit, almost like a nervousness about their, um, their behavior and their attitudes. Uh, because they're, they're sort of like unsure, like, I know there's food here. I've gotten food here before, but now I am torn. I'm torn between my own hunger, trying to find food at Brooks Falls and elsewhere along the river. But I got these little babies that I'm trying to protect. Um, so how can I manage yeah. that? And I think that's a really tough transition for many, many young moms. Yeah, I was very clear with 909 in 2021 when uh, her cub was a springer. Um, she was used to fishing on the lip and she had this little cub. She didn't know what to do with it. She tried to tree it and didn't want to stay in the tree. She was running back and forth and, you know, Grazer and her cubs were on the lip with a bunch of other bears and she just didn't have access to her usual fishing spot. And she had this little thing following her. She didn't know what to do. Um, uh, she was such an, an example of, um, a bear that had to learn by experience. Beautiful view of the lower Brooks river right now. This is, uh, always one of my favorite times of the year, um, at, at Brooks river because of the fall. There's all of the fat glossy bears, uh, <laughs> right now. So. Yeah, Naomi, I hope you're enjoying your time out there when the weather is decent like this to to enjoy these scenes. Oh, yeah, we've been having some beautiful days out there and just, you know, even when there aren't bears there, which is kind of unusual right now, um, it's just, it's so gorgeous. Um, that view is is stunning. And one of the other gorgeous things about the river right now is... Uh, the spawning salmon. So this is off at our riffles camera, again, about a hundred yards downstream of Brooks Falls. Uh, those, those ruby red fish in the water are sockeye salmon. This is a prime spawning habitat for them, a mix of gravel and cobbles, but they can move the gravel out of the way to dig their nests. Females will defend their nesting site from other females, and then males will defend their access to those spawning females. Uh, so you can, it's sometimes it's hard to tell the individuals apart and on the webcam, especially in Naomi, I, I can't do it, but sometimes I'm able, when I've been able to stand on the riffles platform and look down, I can see individual like markings or scars on some of the fish from their spawning activity and be able to track them individually. And it is fascinating to watch how they compete with one another over spawning sites. Oh yeah. And you can see the males, you know, kind of hovering near certain females when, when they've been um, digging an, a nest with their tail. Yeah, so, I, I, you know, the, the amount of work that salmon put into migration and spawning is incredible. We've talked about it frequently, but they stop eating when they enter fresh water. So they're, they fuel their migration on their, their energy reserves fat and protein that they gained in the ocean. And these fish have been here, many of the fish have been here since, um, you know, si since July. Uh, so imagine trying to go that long, not eating, and you're trying to spawn at the same time. Just amazing animals with an incredible amount of endurance. Uh, and, you know, we can't praise them enough for the work that they do in, in keeping this ecosystem healthy and productive like it is. So I, I've gotten a question from a visitor um, who asked, um, so th if, if the salmon run is late, like it was this year, will the spawning be later? 
I don't think so. At least that's my hunch anyway. I because the salmon's you know, whatever is going on in the ocean that maybe delays or had delayed, you know, the, the migration into Brooks River, for instance, at least that's what we're, you know, we seem to, seems to have happened on the cam, what we could see on the cameras this year. You know, a lot of salmon migrating in August, which was not something that we had seen uh, typically uh, at Brooks River in the past. So it seems like the salmon run is shifting later in summer as far as like the migration is concerned. But water temperatures really are the thing that dictate when salmon spawn in fresh water. So uh, sep this year has been a, cool, uh, a normally kind of cool and wet year. So the water temperature should be ideal in September right now for spawning activity. So I my hunch is that when salmon, even though salmon might have arrived late this year, the spawning is going to happen at the same time because the water temperatures and the water conditions are good for it. Um, they don't have to wait for the water to really cool down. Like if it was like a really hot summer, for instance. And I'm going to make another pitch for the Riffles camera and Riffles platform. Oh, sure. It's a great place. <laughs> it's a great place to watch salmon and bears that are at the riffles and it's also a great place uh to watch the falls it's a much underrated place yeah absolutely and it, it, it it's hard to pick a bad spot on brooks river right now to watch bears so from the lower river <laughs> area you know again looking at a river watch camera beautiful dumpling mountain in the background uh up to brooks falls where we have chunk still doing his thing um you know we saw we started the, the broadcast with him looks like maybe we'll have the opportunity to end the broadcast with him naomi and also bring up one final question that we don't have an answer to but somebody was wondering and this question was submitted in advance what bear is going to win fat bear week this year we don't know that that's up to the viewers uh and i think chunk is a, a definitely a, a top contender yeah, um, we um, have begun to work on the bracket. And all I can say is it is a very, very competitive year. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. This is uh, the bracket from last year with uh, 747 uh, winning his second Fapper Week title. Uh, but this year, there's there's a lot of really great candidates. So I'm actually I I'm really never sure. I mean, there's always a surprise in Fat Bear Week, uh, but it's coming in uh, October this year once again, and we hope to announce dates for that uh, very soon. But we don't know who is going to win Fat Bear Week. Uh, but yeah, that's up to you. And, and we encourage everyone to campaign for the bears that they think are the fattest and most successful at Brooks River. Uh, this year. Uh, and right now you can submit posters uh, on Explored Org campaign posters for people to vote on who you think uh, should be uh, the Fat Bear champion this year. So definitely um, get out the vote once uh, we have Fat Bear Week uh, voting open and then definitely campaign for your favorite bear. We love the debate. Uh, of course, uh, you know, you want to be civil towards your fellow uh, Bear Camp viewers, but we, we love the debate between Bear Camp fans on who they think is uh, the fattest and most successful bear of the year. And I think there's a really good argument for Chunk. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny when I'm looking at him now, I almost think like I'm anthropomorphizing greatly, but it's that scar, it's almost like he, he put it there purposefully to look like the fiercest bear on the river. I know he didn't, he got it in a fight, but it just does look, make him look fierce. Well, this has been a fun broadcast, Naomi. Both our internet connections held up, which is awesome. So uh, a little less nerve wracking for me. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining me today. It's been fun. Yes, it was great. And as you continue to watch Bears at Brooks River over the next several weeks, we're going to get fatter in the lead up to our annual Fat Bear Week competition. And we'll have more announcements about that. Uh, coming up uh, soon. We have another play-by-play -play coming up next Tuesday. Same bear time, same bear channel. And join us then. Uh, and in the meantime, enjoy the competition that you see on, on the river. Uh, enjoy the 
adaptability and the individuality of all of these bears. Um, and I think we can admire how bears work through the challenges and difficulties that they face as well. Uh, my name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. My co-host today has been Katmai National Park Ranger Naomi Boak. And until we talk to you again, make sure to enjoy the bears. And as we like to say at explore.org, never stop learning.